So uh, I would like to, to speak about um, a result about controllability, but don't panic. I, I won't use any specific knowledge on controllability. We'll try to recall everything which is necessary. And that's something about the incompressible Navier-Stokes equation in 3D. It's a joint work with Jia Jiang, Liao, and Ping Zhang. Actually, it's a part of a thesis of uh, Jia Jiang, Liao, who uh, now finished his PhD thesis. He's still in, uh, in, uh, in China because of the situation, but probably at some point he, he will try to uh, apply to a postdoc position. So let me uh, uh, take this opportunity to uh, recommend him because it's very good, very impressive, in particular technically. So I, I would like to, um, to um, explain how to uh, prove how to drive the Navier-Stokes system from some initial state to a final state in a given time. And I will consider the case where the fluid occupies a bounded domain and the control will be on a part of the domain. And on the remaining part, we will uh, prescribe the Navier boundary condition. I would be very happy to uh, to also uh, be able to deal with the no-slip boundary condition. But for a general result, so far we are only able to deal with the Navier boundary conditions. I will try to explain where it helps to consider these conditions rather than the no-slip one, okay? Uh, okay? So let me uh, explain the setting. So we have a smooth, nice domain. So by nice, I mean bounded, simply connected. Well, actually we could also uh, and all multiply connected, but let us keep simple for the, for the talk. And uh, once again, so the control will be on one part, uh, I will denote it sigma, on one part on, of the boundary, okay? The control um, is encoded by the fact that you can choose what you prescribe on the part, on the subset sigma on the boundary. And on the other part, you prescribe the Navier condition. So here U is the velocity, P the pressure, and you have the initial data. So what I call Navier boundary condition, it's um, rather a family of uh, boundary conditions, actually. And here I think it's uh, probably the most general uh, with a matrix A of X. In 3D, it's um, quite nice to have this um, uh, variable coefficient matrix. In particular, you may want to choose the shape operator for this matrix. Um, and depending on what, what you choose for A, you can recover some um, particular cases that perhaps you know, some condition where you prescribe rather the uh, tangential part of the vorticity in 3D, or uh, some condition on the normal derivative of U. But there are various ways to, uh, to uh, write and to rewrite this boundary condition. Well, the, what is important here is that it's a condition where, where you have the first order derivatives involved rather than the no-slip condition where it's just about you. So remember that's a boundary condition which is given, and you see it's homogeneous, it's equal to zero, and um, that is given. So you can choose what happens on the, uh, on the other part of the boundary, but this Navier uh, slip with friction, there is no source term or whatever, they are given. So the result is the following. Given some positive time, capital T, given some initial data in H1, then there exists a solution with the regularity that you expect from a data uh, which is in H1. So a solution which is continuous in time with values in H1 and L2 in time with values in H2. So you have such a solution, a solution of Navier-Stokes, and with the property that at the given time, capital T, the, the velocity field vanishes everywhere in the domain, okay? So that's a theorem giving the existence of one solution which starts from some given initial data in H1 and after some given time, capital T, which is perhaps very small, then you have zero, okay? So you, you will drive the system from any initial state to, the, to rest, okay? In some imparted time. Okay, so uh, let me try to... Um, explain uh, first why I wrote uh, smooth. I wrote smooth because you see the choice of H1 in 3D, it's, uh, it's better than uh, H1 half, which is critical for Navier-Stokes in three dimension. So it means that we built a solution which is quite smooth actually. So along all the process, uh, the solution is smooth and um, it's an existence uh, theorem for sure. There is no uniqueness in the statement. 
for many reasons. Because as it is stated, you have no chance to have uniqueness. If you have um, one strategy, if you have one solution, such as in the theorem, you can um, build some uh, uh, infinite number of other ones. Because imagine that you uh, reach zero, not in the time t, but in the time t over two, then you can extend the solution by zero between t over two and t, and then you have another solution, okay? If you are able to reach zero at any time, you can reach before and then extend by zero. So of course, there is no uniqueness. It's because I don't mention the control explicitly. It's an underdetermined system. I do not say anything about what I prescribe on sigma. In the course of the proof, I will try to explicit as much as I can uh, how the, the control is chosen. But here in the statement, I don't say anything on what I'm prescribed on sigma and there are various strategies for sure. Okay. So here the interest to, uh, to prove uh, a result with a smooth solution is that um, somehow it says that uh, the process is perhaps close to uh, engineering uh, preoccupation because the, the solution is, uh, is not that wild, it's a nice smooth solution. We are already um, able to drive the system in a smooth way to rest. Okay. In particular, I would like to um, try to explain how to, um, um, to take these results with respect to some other ones. So in particular, previously, uh, with Jean-Michel Coron and Frédéric Marbach, we did um, a result proving the existence of such a solution, reaching zero in some given time, but in the Leray class, in the class of Leray weak solution, so with weekly continuous in time uh, with values in L2 and L2 in time with values in H1. So here, the, the thing is that we uh, have been able to upgrade this result from weak solution to smooth solution. Okay? So we prove that uh, it's possible to, to find a controlled solution reaching zero, which is smooth all along its, its life. Okay? And I would like also to try to compare with some uh, recent uh, nice results on a, a wild solution. Uh, perhaps the, uh, some people could have some confusion. I would like to explain that it's two rather different games. Okay, uh, so I would like to compare uh, with uh, what has been obtained by a lot of people. I mentioned here uh, the recent work by Buckmaster, Colombo, and Vicol, but there are many other ones. Uh, I know that yesterday I missed uh, a talk uh, by Alexei Sheskidov about that. Uh, so and there are many other other works, of course. So uh, I would like to to explain the differences between. Uh, these two lines of research. So uh, in the work, for instance, of uh, uh, Buckmaster and, and Vicol, they succeeded to, uh, to construct some, uh, let's say, very weak solution, some solution which are in the energy space and which starting from some initial, some given initial data, reach exactly zero as well at some finite time. But these solutions are, um, uh, are not, for instance, in L2 with values in, in H1. Uh, they are not Loray solution. And the fact that a such selection exists um, is due to uh, the lack of regularity. It's possible to, uh, to uh, build some quite wild solution with some strange behavior uh, without, uh, without, if you don't have so much regularity. On the contrary, what we did with, uh, uh, with uh, my co-authors is to um, take advantage on the fact that you can choose what happens on a subset of the boundary to construct some nice solution uh, reaching zero at some given time. So in the result with Corwin and Marbach, it was in Loray's uh, class of solution. So uh, they were already smoother than in the result by uh, Buckmaster and Bicol, for instance, because they were in L2 values in H1. And in the previous result, uh, the one I, I want to discuss today, it's even, uh, the gap is even uh, bigger in the sense that we start from H1 initial data, and we construct a solution which stay in H1 at any time. Yeah. And actually, because H1 is more regular than H1 half, which is critical, the, this result could be easily extended to any regularity, let's say H200, if you want. You know, once you are above this uh, threshold, there is no difficulty to uh, propagate smoothness. Okay. So uh, it, it's really a, a different game where you, you take benefit of, uh, of some freedom to. Uh, to drive the solution to zero. And actually, in the, in the course of the proof of, uh, of this result, 
the controllability from H1 to H1 data to zero, we are going to use uh, earlier results where uh, the case of a small H3 initial data was considered. So it, it was H3, so something um, smoother, but the, the important uh, thing here is that it was small in H3. And in particular, when you have small data for Navistocks, you can use linear techniques. You can pretend that uh, the Navistocks system behaves a little bit like the unsteady stock system and use some linear techniques. And uh, that's how uh, Sergio Guerrero succeeded to, um, to prove uh, controllability to zero in this case, in the case of a small H1 data. He, he used some uh, Carleman estimates, which are uh, linear techniques. Uh, and these estimates were actually uh, initiated, uh, were actually due to uh, uh, Fursikov and Immanuelov in the 90s. In, in that uh, result, it's a parabolic Carleman. There's also another line of research where people use uh, elliptic Carleman estimates, uh, people like uh, Gilles Lebeau, for instance. So there are different techniques, but in uh, each case, it's, uh, they, they use linear techniques. Okay. So we are going to, to use these earlier results in, in, uh, in the course of our proof. But of course, uh, we have to do something before because uh, we start from a perhaps big H1 initial data and this result is for small H3 initial data. And actually we are going to combine uh, three uh, types of results. The previous one, a regularization result, that you, which you probably know uh, for the uncontrolled Navistock system. If you start from uh, H1 data, well, in 3D, it could be that there is uh, some blow up or not, but at least for short times, uh, you may find some short times for which you have a smooth data, you have a smooth state. Okay? So even if you start with the H1 initial data, after some perhaps very small positive times, you will have something quite smooth, even actually analytic if the boundary is analytic. And the third result that we are going to use is actually the, the most difficult, and that would be the, the core of the proof, is the following theorem. Assume that you start with a very nice initial data in, in the Sobolev space H200. Then you can find a solution with the H1 regularity, which almost uh, reaches zero in the sense that it would be small in H1 at the given time capital T. So it's approximate controllability. We are not reaching uh, zero. We are approximately reaching zero since the final state is small in H1. So I pretend that by combining these results, you may succeed to prove the theorem driving H1 to zero. Let's, let's see in detail. So you start from H1 data. You wait a little bit to have uh, H200 data, which is perhaps uh, big, but then you use the theorem after. So you use the theorem with, let's say, T over four. I will need to, to uh, split into four steps. After T over four, you will have something small in H1. And then you use again the regularization result. Actually, you use a quantitative version of this regularization result, meaning that uh, being small in H1 at some time, then at some uh, time a little bit later, you will have something which is small in H3. Okay, you can um, uh, prove some uh, quantitative bounds to this regularization process. And then once you have something small in H3, you can use the earlier result by Guerrero, the one which used linear techniques because you are small. So the core of the proof is this theorem starting from a nice initial data and reaching almost zero in H1. Okay? So that's what we are going to, to prove. We see a sketch of proof actually. So here there is a, a strategy which is really a non-linear strategy. It's um, uh, perhaps surprising at first sight, but we are going to um, somehow increase the amplitude of the solution. We are looking for a solution and we can choose whatever we want on a part of the boundary. On the other hand, we, we do not choose the initial data. It is what it is. So the strategy is to say, okay, I want to control what happens. So I prefer to separate the scales and to choose something very big on the control part of the boundary, something much more bigger than the initial data. So that at least I will know what is the main part of the solution. So somehow the U0, the leading term, 
it's quite singular. It's created by the control part of the boundary, by appropriate action on this part of the boundary. And U1, the second term, it's what is due normally to the initial data. The initial data, it was U in it with no, no scaling. So we introduce a small parameter and we try to separate the effect of a boundary that we control and the effect of the initial data. So you see um, this amplitude is given by one over epsilon. And on the other hand, we want to drive the solution, which means that if uh, we, we want a chance to be able to control the dynamics, we need to, to look at some solution which depends on t over epsilon. So we also have to act very quickly with a, a strong amplitude and to compete with this uh, nonlinear effect, we, we also need to act quickly to have uh, some strong term coming from the time derivative. Okay. So somehow we choose to work with a high Reynolds regime. Okay. At the beginning, maybe it was one, but now we are looking at uh, Reynolds number of order uh, one over epsilon. And if you do that, um, if you plug this uh, expansion into the equation, what you obtain for u0, for the leading part, is the Euler equation. If you discard the smaller terms, you will have uh, Euler equation for u0. And for u1, the second term, which is due to the initial data, you will have uh, Euler equation linearized around u0. And then uh, we have to choose uh, the solutions, some appropriate solution to this Euler equation. So for U0, uh, there is a choice which is due to some earlier work by Jean-Michel Coron and Olivier Glass. So Jean-Michel Coron worked on the 2D case, in particular with some uh, complex analysis, and Olivier Glass succeeded to uh, extend to the 3D case. And they proved that there, is, there exists a, a control solution of the Euler equation, which flushes the domain in the sense that uh, the flow map, which is associated with this solution, goes everywhere inside the domain and then go out by the control part of the boundary. So it's really flushed out of the domain in the time which is given, before the time capital T. And moreover, this uh, solution, this uh, Euler solution U0, uh, you can choose it starting from zero and with final value equal to zero as well. So it's really something that you turn on after some time and you turn off before the final time. Okay? It's something temporary, uh, auxiliary solution that you use in order to flush what, what is normally due to the initial data. Something strong that you turn on from the boundary, uh, which you use for some time to flush actually the vorticity, which is due to the initial data. And this uh, auxiliary solution U0 has also an extra feature, which is uh, that it is irrotational. It can be chosen irrotational. So the only vorticity is the vorticity due to the initial data, which is transported by the linear transport equation. It's transported by the flow of U0. And that's why it, it is flush uh, before the time t. And if at the end you have no vorticity inside the domain, you can just close the door everywhere. And then uh, if, you are, if you are divergence free, curl free with uh, uh, U dot N, you, you will have uh, uh, U equal to zero, okay? So that's the strategy. You uh, use this auxiliary field but uh, you uh, do have a problem with this strategy, which is that this auxiliary flow U0 is a solution to Euler, and as such, it cannot satisfy the Navier condition. It's too much to ask for Euler solution. It can only satisfy the condition U0.n, uh, so the uh, condition on U0.n, but you cannot uh, ask too much to, uh, to this uh, solution. And because of this solution, uh, boundary layer is created um, close to the uncontrolled part of the boundary. And this boundary layer is the second term now. You see this uh, V term, it's uh, also a singular term. The amplitude is one over square root. So it's, it's not um, uh, as big as the first one, but it's still singular and it's still worse than the term with U1, which is the one you should have at the beginning because of the initial data. So it's not so good. You have a quite awful term with a bad amplitude. And moreover, uh, you have some extra scales in this term. You have, of course, the, the scale T over epsilon, because this boundary layer is here to compensate uh, what U0 is not able to do on the boundary. It's a boundary layer which is here to compensate the trace of U0. So of course, it depends on T over epsilon. It, it evolves very quickly in time as well. 
and there is a other extra scale which is a, the usual scale in boundary layers which correspond to a distance to the uncontrolled part of the boundary that's the phi over square root of epsilon and if you look at this equation for v uh, what you obtain by plugging the expansion to the Navier-Stokes equation what you obtain is this equation uh, which is a, a linear uh, parabolic let's say equation um, but you have to observe that there are um, uh, different uh, variables. You have the fast variable uh, denoted by two, and you have also a fast um, a space variable, which is z. So it's parabolic with respect to two and z. So that's the first and the last term, for instance. You can, it looks like uh, the heat equation corresponding to these fast scales. But you also have some other terms in particular, the, the second one, the gray one, it uses, it involves a nabla operator. And this nabla operator is really with respect to x, to the original space variable. And then you have also another term, but don't pay too much attention. It's not so important. The z, dz, it's not so important. So you see, uh, there is something like heat equation with respect to fast scales and transport with respect to the original scale transport by u0. And uh, of course, you have a boundary condition on uh, the uncontrolled part of, of the boundary, the dz of v. So that's what gives the Navier condition at the level of this boundary layer. You, uh, you uh, plug also the expansion into the Navier condition, and you end up with this condition on dz of v. And dz of v has to be equal to something which is due to u0. u0 is the Euler solution. You cannot really uh, um, choose u0 in order to have uh, zero at this place. You have something in general which is due to u0, and that's why this boundary layer is created it's because of the source term in the boundary condition. So that's a problem because uh, you would like to reach zero at the end, at the final time, and because of this auxiliary flow that you turn on, you have a boundary layer. And this boundary layer, you see, it's, uh, it's turned on, and you don't know exactly how to turn it off. It's a parabolic equation. It's, it looks like a heat equation. Even if you turn off the source by inertia, you will still have some energy in this boundary layer. So you have to find something. And here, what we are going to do is to uh, use uh, the transport term. So the gray term with the nabla, we are going to um, use transport from the control uh, part of the boundary in order to compensate what comes from the uncontrolled part of the boundary. So here you see in the set of equation, um, it's still underdetermined. Actually, because of this transport, uh, I can prescribe what is entering into the domain. So I'm going to choose what is entering into the domain in order to compensate what comes from the dz of v equation. Actually, you cannot really compensate exactly because you see it's not the same process. Uh, on, the, on the one hand, the transport equation is with, with transport equation and it's with respect to x. On the other hand, uh, with respect to z, it's a heat equation and it's another variable z. So you cannot really hope um, that the uh, uh, functional analysis match uh, completely uh, at this level. The, this equation. Uh, you, you cannot tackle this equation in the same uh, functional sp spaces. But what you can hope is to um, look at the intersection in some natural spaces, which uh, could be uh, done with Fourier modes. You can try to compensate just for a huge number of Fourier modes, but a finite number of modes, in order to ensure that you will have a good decay in large time. Remember that here it's a fast scale. You have a new time scale, which is tau. So even if you have to do this in, cap in a time capital T for the original time variable, for this new time variable tau, it's capital T divided by epsilon. So it becomes large when epsilon is small. Okay. That's the interest of uh, introducing this small parameter. So what you, what you do here is that you try to um, compensate enough modes in order to have a good behavior of this boundary layer for large time. So what we call the, 
Kaiten Sushi Strategy. So you know it's uh, this kind of um, Japanese restaurant where the food is prepared in the kitchen, but there is no waiter. The food is sent to the dining room by some conveyor belt all around the, all around the wall. And that's somehow what we do here. Uh, you see the control part of the boundary, sigma. You can imagine that as a door and on the other, uh, on the other side of the door, you may imagine that there is the kitchen, kind of extension of the domain. And in there, you prepare um, the, the dishes. Uh, that is, you prepare uh, what would compensate the modes uh, which correspond to uh, the boundary layer uh, due to uh, the uncontrolled part of the boundary. Okay? So you, you use the transport by U0 to send uh, what is needed to adjust um, the integral, uh, you, you may think at Fourier mode, or you may think at convolution with some uh, integral corresponding to uh, the first moment. And you try to, um, to match uh, between what is due to the uncontrolled part of the boundary and what is due to, uh, to um, what is prepared in, uh, in the kitchen. Okay, so thanks to that, you can ensure that at the end, uh, the V term is perhaps not zero, but uh, it's small because of, uh, of uh, decay in large time. And actually, uh, because you want something which is small in H1, you only really need to go farther. Here, I only wrote uh, the beginning of the expansion. You, you see that uh, uh, some of them have already very big amplitudes in L infinity. But of course, when you look at the H1 topology, it's even worse because when you take some derivative in space, for instance, you will have some extra one over square root of H7. So actually you have to expand uh, way farther and uh, you have to uh, take into account some other phenomenon. The V term, actually it was a boundary layer for the tangential component, but there are also some weaker boundary layer for the normal uh, component of the velocity. And there are also uh, what I like to call backflow which means that uh, there is also an influence at lower order terms uh, inside the domain. So you have some terms a little bit like a U1 that you have to, uh, to actually to split because there are some part which is somehow irrotational and some part which is somehow uh, rotational. So you have various pieces and you have to uh, ensure that there is a, a control, that there is an action to do on sigma uh, in order to ensure that each piece of this uh, asymptotic expression uh, decays to, uh, to zero uh, for large time. Once again, because of the choice of T over epsilon, we, we are um, led to uh, study the, the behavior of boundary, laser, of boundary layers in large time. Usually we fight uh, to, uh, to prove uh, short time existence for boundary layers, but in, in this setting, since we can control what happens, and because here we just have a linear equation for boundary layer, it's possible to, um, to uh, tackle the large time behavior. Okay? It's very specific to this, uh, to this setting in which we try to build one solution, one appropriate solution. So the thing is that um, once you build uh, such uh, asymptotic expansion, it's still a approximate solution, but you can prove actually the existence of, of some exact solution close to this uh, approximate one. Uh, for this, you estimate uh, the remainder. And um, uh, perhaps some of you knows, uh, know the work by Masmoudi and Rousset in particular about uh, the, the viscous, uh, about the vanishing viscosity limits for the Navier condition and also for the water waves, for the viscous water waves, and how it's quite similar. So they, they have a, um, a pair of papers where they perform some estimates um, at, the, at the smooth level. It's not really H1, to be honest, it's a, a different uh, setting with a more uh, tangential derivative. And uh, somehow um, to pr prove that there exists some exact solution, we uh, use some kinds of um, large time counterparts of these estimates by Masmoudi and Rousset. They did that for times of order one. And what we did with Chajang and Ping is to see how in a case where you have chosen with care 
the, the first Fourier modes, how to extend these estimates, uh, which correspond to vanishing viscosity, because uh, remember that this choice of epsilon of the amplitude, it, it makes the system work in uh, high Reynolds regime. So somehow you are, you are in the same position than in these papers, um, but you have to handle a large time. And you, um, you, you proceed in quite similar way and you can prove that there, there, there exists an exact solution uh, close to the approximate solution, which are very small at the end. So you can conclude that there are some exact solution, which for epsilon small enough, satisfy the theorem, which I recall, starting from a, a nice initial data. It's useful to have a nice initial data here because you know when you build uh, asymptotic expansion, usually you uh, use a lot of regularity because you do it by iteration. So you are very happy to start with uh, data which is in H200 because you have to write a, quite a long asymptotic expansion and at each term satisfy an equation with some source terms due to the previous one. So usually you uh, use a lot of regularity. So you are quite happy here to start with uh, a smooth initial data. And the thing is that you obtain uh, uh, a solution to NS, which is smooth. It's given by an asymptotic expansion and each piece satisfy uh, uh, is a smooth solution of this profile problem. So you, you have uh, construct, you have exhibit, um, exact uh, smooth solution to NS stocks, which at the end is a very small in H1, thanks to the large decay, to the large time decay. So uh, once again, once you have this approximate controllability result, you can combine with the other result I mentioned, the regularization step, the result by Guerrero with the Carleman estimates. And then you can conclude that you, you, you do have some exact solution to Navier-Stokes, starting from H1 and reaching exactly zero after some time. Remember that once you are small in H1, then you are small in H3, and then you can use uh, Guerrero's result. So that's the, the first result I, I wanted to present. Uh, I'll try to, to uh, go fast for the second one. It, it goes along the same line. It's just a different game. It's Lagrangian controllability. So here the, the game is about, a, a, let's say, a patch of a fluid. You, uh, you may imagine that uh, there, there is a part of uh, Ontario Lake which is polluted, and you want acting only on the Canadian border, you want to drive this uh, patch of polluted water away from uh, the beach of Toronto. Uh, and you, you would like to do that in some given time, let's say. So here, of course, you have some condition because you deal with incompressible flow. So you can only hope to, uh, to drive a patch of fluid onto a, a domain with the same volume. And actually, you also have some um, topologic uh, condition uh, because a, a, a nice flow map will uh, preserve some uh, of the topological properties. Okay. So actually, uh, I, I try to make a real statement here. Yeah, so uh, you start with some given time, with some uh, nice older initial data. It's better for flow map here yeah, to uh, work with older data, but it's not so important. And then um, you start with um, initial Jordan surface, and the final one, so that's uh, small gamma zero, small gamma one, and you have this uh, isotopy uh, condition, and the, the condition about the volume. And then uh, we are going to exhibit a solution for which the flow map uh, drive the, the fluid which is surrounded by the initial surface gamma zero onto uh, the volume which is surrounded by gamma one. So here I preset just the notation for the flow map. I already used it a little bit, but here I precise for the next statement, right, the central, uh, the central object. So you see, uh, thanks to this flow map, uh, we can um, send gamma zero to gamma one approximately uh, in CK. So let me try to be more precise. So it's not an exact, um, it's not an exact controllability result. It's only approximate. Yeah, we, we don't know how to conclude to go from approximate to exact, but we think that actually there are so many uh, topological properties which are uh, conserved by the flow map, but probably it's not even so relevant to try to have an exact theorem. 
And also, there is something that you may notice about the time. Uh, what we prove uh, is that there, there is a time before the imparted time. And we cannot uh, guarantee that um, this time is exactly capital T. Because here, what we, what we are trying to do, that's why I, I did uh, the picture, actually. What we are trying to do is to drive the polluted water from some place to another, but still in the lake. We don't want to flush it out this time. So it means that if uh, there is a lot of vorticity in this zone, since it will stay in the domain, I cannot guarantee that there is no blow up, actually. So it's very really different than in the previous case. In the previous case, uh, I was able to guarantee that the solution uh, lives, actually. Thanks to the control, you can sometimes maintain the lifetime of a solution, of a smooth solution. In this game, with Lagrangian uh, controllability, we are playing at uh, driving a patch of polluted water from one place to another, but without going out of the domain. So that's why we cannot really uh, contain something which could go bad with uh, uh, increasing vorticity. Okay. So here uh, we can do it uh, quicker than asked, but we cannot really do it in uh, some given time. Okay. I don't know if it matters so much, for, uh, if it does matter so much for engineering purposes, but. Uh, uh, that's something that you have to care about, at least in free, in free dimension. Uh, blow up is possible. So actually, uh, such results uh, were uh, already obtained by Glass and Orsin for the earlier equation and for the steady stokes. So here it's uh, an extension to the Navier-Stokes system of, uh, of these results. And uh, here I, I mentioned in older just to, uh, to try to make something clear, but. Uh, it's possible to do something with uh, just the H1 initial data, but then you have a few technical conditions, which uh, I spare to you. <laughs> um, so actually, this, uh, this one can be proved almost along the same lines with uh, asymptotic expansion using a uh, nonlinear strategy, uh, a huge action on the boundary, uh, appropriate solution of Euler. But this appropriate solution of Euler is not the same. It's not a, a solution which flushes everything. You have to choose it in another way. Um, uh, which I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't detail, but it's the thing to, um, to try to rely on the uh, parts of the equation. And there is the same thing to use to introduce a small parameter to separate the scales and the phenomenon, to try to use the nonlinear feature of a system at your advantage, and to uh, try to take care of the boundary layers by some uh, uh, appropriate estimates. Uh, and maybe to conclude, uh, I will try to uh, uh, explain uh, what is uh, our goal in, in this line of research. As I mentioned at the beginning, uh, we, we would like to be able to deal with a no-slip condition. But of course, it's not that simple, because at least with this strategy, uh, what is quite bad is first that you have a boundary layer, which is even worse. It was already singular in uh, the Navier case, it was one over square root, the amplitude was one over square root. In the case of um, no slip condition, is one over epsilon. So it's even uh, more singular. And then, um, in general, the equation that you get for uh, the boundary layer is a nonlinear point equation. And even if you can uh, use some control, uh, you can choose some uh, uh, what happens on a part of a boundary, it's quite difficult to, well, first, to maintain uh, alive this boundary layer. And it's even more difficult to try to, um, to um, drive this boundary layer because it's nonlinear. You cannot really hope to compensate anything. Um, it's way more difficult to um, adapt this strategy. So what we did with uh, Coron, Marbach, and uh, Zhang um, is a little bit different. And actually, it's, uh, it's more uh, uh, limited in terms of geometry, in terms of domain. We still consider any initial data, but we consider the case of a rectangle. The fluid occupies a rectangle, so it's a 2D result. And we use a particular uh, case of a boundary layer, uh, which corresponds to shear flows, and for which we can use a cauchy kovalevskaya techniques, so some uh, analytic techniques. So we, we have a partial result, but it's not completely um, satisfying because we still need to act a little bit inside, not so much, but we need a little bit of, of um, control inside the domain, not only on the boundary. And uh, with um, 
Xiaojiang and Ping, we are trying to extend this to a 3D case, still for smooth solution. And uh, we are trying some other techniques. Uh, as you see, uh, you have a lot of possibility. You try to break the problem into uh, small pieces, and then you, you hope to puzzle uh, everything uh, out at the end. So uh, of course, you can uh, imagine a lot of uh, scenarios. And if anyone has uh, some other ones, of course, we'll be happy to, to, uh, to hear them. Thank you for your attention.